is a research study which is testing a new treatment uh, for treatment of any condition. Um, here we're talking about breast cancer, but clinical trials, as we've all seen in the news recently, are used to evaluate all sorts of different treatments from vaccines for infectious diseases to cancer. Uh, clinical trials come in several phases, and the ones you've most probably heard of are phase one, two, and three. Phase one clinical trials um, are the most variable. Um, many of the phase one trials are uh, so-called first in human studies, where we're testing a new drug for the first time in people and trying to understand the best dose. But there are also phase one studies which are looking at combinations. So there may be two drugs that we already use routinely or two drugs that we do know some a fair amount of information about. But when we combine them for the first time, those are also considered phase one trials. So what's important about phase one trials is to understand that not all phase one trials are the same. Phase two trials are trials where we have a dose that is recommended to start with, so we understand what the right starting dose is. And we're really trying to get a better sense of both the safety profile, but also the potential effectiveness of a drug in a more specific patient population. So for example, triple negative breast cancer. And then finally, a phase three trial is when we have data from phase one and two, we have some preliminary sense that a new treatment will be effective in breast cancer, and we're now testing against standard of care treatment. And so an important principle in the phase three trials is that at least for breast cancer, we don't really have any trials that test a treatment versus no treatment. The trials, even if they have a placebo, are testing some new treatment against a standard treatment. So I think that there are, they have a lot of things in common, but let's look at an example. For example, if we think about a, a treatment trial, because we have not, not all the clinical trials are focused on treatments, but if we look at a, a treatment trial, um, uh, when you come for, for a clinical trial, the same things that would happen on, on traditional cancer care would happen here as well. You have your blood work drawn to make sure that it's okay for you to be treated. You'll be seen by your doctor. A decision will be made whether you are treated or not. At certain point, you will have scans or not, depending, of course, if we are talking about metastatic breast cancer. So in that way, everything is very similar. The differences are on the evidence that we have to support that treatment. So it's in a research protocol because it has not been approved yet. So we are still investigating and learning if this is safe, depending on what the phase is and if it's better than what it's currently available. And what I tell my patients as well is that there are more eyes looking at you when you are going on a clinical trial because we want to make sure that it's safe and that uh, uh, nothing happens that it's unexpected. So in addition to your treatment team, you have the research team, you have the IRB, you have many other uh, people and institutions that are uh, um, overseeing your, your participation in the clinical trial. Yes, yeah, so I would say that one of the most important things to do as a next step, an action item, is to communicate your interest in clinical trials to your oncologist. Uh, I think that um, people sometimes make assumptions based on maybe you have young children or you're, you live far from the uh, research center or whatever it is, that people sometimes make wrong assumptions about whether you might be interested in a clinical trial or not. And the most efficient way to make sure that you are opinions are known is to just make them known uh, and to let your doctor know that you really are interested in trials. You'd be willing to travel X number of miles or X number of hours to look for a trial. Uh, those are things that are really important because that can really open the conversation to start looking for trials that might match your situation. I think clinical trials are particularly important for um, metastatic for patients with metastatic breast cancer because they offer um, uh, other opportunities uh, um, uh, for treatment. So um, most of the clinical trials, um, uh, in particular in phase three, will compare uh, promising drugs with standard of care. So by participating in a clinical trial, uh, not only uh, may help patients in the future that are diagnosed with this disease, 
but might help as well the patient that goes on the trial if that drug turns out to be approved. So you might end up having access to a drug earlier on before it receives FDA approval. Obviously, this is not a guarantee because you might end up in the standard of care. Many of these drugs, unfortunately, or some of these drugs end up not being approved if they fail to show that they are uh, as good or better than the standard of care. But I think that it brings another layer of options and hopes for patients that are uh, living with this disease. Sometimes on a clinical trial, the trial treatment turns out not to work and we see a scan or other uh, test that tells us that's the case. So at that time, a patient would be taken off the clinical trial and then they would have a discussion again with, uh, with their oncologist as to the different options, including standard options. So in general, having participated in a previous clinical trial really doesn't preclude other standard of care options uh, afterwards. Sometimes patients uh, are afraid of what does this mean, especially if they are not being treated by the same doctor in the same institution that offers them the clinical trials. There's always this concern, well, I don't want to lose my oncologist who I really like. And, uh, and that does not need to happen and doesn't happen uh, the vast majority of the times. In fact, there are patients, sometimes they they while they are on the trial, they are only followed at the center where they are having, where they are participating in the clinical trial, and then they go back to their primary oncologist. But there are patients as well that keep seeing uh, their primary oncologist, not as often as, as the, the oncologist that is taking care of them for the clinical trial, but from time to time, so that's their oncologist, their primary oncologist know as well how they are doing. So there's a lot of options, and I think that the focus is what works better for the patient and, uh, and, uh, and, and for the patients to feel that this continues to be a team effort to, to find out and come up with the best option for the patient at each time. So the way that you determine what is the clinical trial that is best for, for a certain patient at each time is, has to do with a lot of factors. The, the subtype of breast cancer that you have, the previous lines of therapy, which means uh, is this your first treatment, which sometimes we call the first line, or have you received other treatments? And if you have received other treatments, what were those? Because obviously we don't want to offer you on a trial, offer you a trial with a drug that you received not a long time ago and it stopped working. So those are some of the factors that we take into consideration. Then of course it has to do as well with how often do you need to come to the center? There are uh, trials that require you to come often, uh, many times the phase one trials that Dr. Lin spoke about at the beginning, uh, because we need to do more often uh, blood work. Others, you only need to come two or three times uh, every two or three weeks. And now we even have clinical trials that happen at home. So all those uh, um, characteristics of the clinical trials and requirements we, we take into consideration uh, uh, for our patients. And then the other thing I would add is that, you know, as I talk about clinical trial options with patients, I always lay out if you're not on a clinical trial, these are the things I would consider um, thinking about for you. And if you are on a clinical trial, this is what I would consider. And then you can really kind of weigh those options. Um, and what I will also tell uh, you um, and reassure people is that, you know, when the clinical trials are evaluated, they go through um, what we call the IRB, which is our review process. And part of that process is to really try to uh, to evaluate whether the trial treatment would be a reasonable option for a patient in comparison to what the standard of care option would be. And so we don't want to open trials where we don't feel we wouldn't feel comfortable with somebody going on a trial instead of the standard option. We really look for trials um, that makes sense. And so examples of this could be if there's a very effective treatment as the first treatment, a trial that we might consider would be a trial where we use the same treatment and we add a new drug. That's a very comfortable trial because you know people are getting the standard treatment and they get something extra we hope is better, but we don't know. Or similarly, uh, or in contrast, uh, for a patient where the standard treatments we know don't work very well, 
Um, there, you know, we might um, pull in trials or open trials, which are really of much more newer agents, uh, because there, as we weigh some the standard of care that might not work very well, we're going to be more open to, to new and exciting treatments that look very good in the lab, but for which we might not have as much data in people. Eligibility criteria are the uh, list of characteristics that a patient um, or their cancer needs to have in order to uh, qualify for a study. Uh, now, you know, they can be a little bit complicated. Um, some of them are very simple, like you have to have a diagnosis of breast cancer or you have to be an adult. Uh, some of them are more complicated, like how many types of previous chemotherapy you've gotten or what kinds of chemotherapy you've received. The reason that we have eligibility criteria is really two reasons. One is a safety reason. So if a drug is metabolized by the liver, we don't really want to allow patients on whose liver function is very abnormal because we worry that the side effects might be more and that they may be more in an unpredictable way. So there's, a safe, there's often a safety reason for some of the qualification criteria. The other reason is a scientific reason related to the study question. So, for example, your question might be in patients who've already whose cancer have already gotten worse through uh, several chemotherapies, is this new treatment effective, meaning is it going to be effective against resistant cancers? And so to answer a question like that, you need to require in your eligibility that patients have received some minimum number of previous chemotherapy treatments. So those are just two examples of the two main categories of why we have eligibility and exclusion criteria. Um, for the most part, we try to look at these in a two-part way. So there's the obvious ones, and we don't want to present patients trial options if we can check off right away that they're not eligible, because it's really hard to tell somebody about a study and then say that they don't qualify. And once you get past that first um, uh, checkpoint, uh, then if a patient is interested in a study, they may sign a consent form to go on to receive additional testing to make sure they meet the rest of the criteria. That is so interesting. And I think that this is a field that uh, has been evolving in the past because while I think that, and, and uh, uh, to second what Dr. Lin said, we want to make sure that uh, um, we get the right conclusions out of the clinical trials, whether a drug benefits a group of patients or not, sometimes the eligibility criteria can be seen as being too rigid and being selecting a, a population that might not otherwise represent the general population. So there have been efforts to try to broaden the eligibility criteria in certain characteristics that we feel that might not harm the, the, the conclusions of the trial and, and still being open for more patients that might uh, represent better the general population. And a lot of work has been, uh, is being done in the fields in terms of the age, what, what should be the, 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 um, um, the, 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 if there should be a certain age for, for after which patients can go on trials presence of brain mats, and Dr. Lin has done a lot of work in that field, HIV and comorbidities, meaning, you know, sometimes patients are excluded um, if they had certain conditions, other diseases. And I think that in a lot of trials, we are, or there is an effort to think, do we really need to exclude those patients or those patients can safely be included in clinical trials? So a lot of work being done in these fields. Uh, patients can enroll in a clinical trial if they already received uh, uh, prior standard treatment. So um, this depends on what we spoke earlier today about the eligibility criteria and what are the previous lines of therapy. So that is something that the, the oncologist, when it's considering when he's considering a clinical trial for a patient, will make sure to see if that specific protocol or clinical trial applies for patients that have received uh, uh, prior standard therapies. But yes, many of our uh, many of the clinical trials options are for patients who already received prior standard therapies. Mm -hmm.
So one question that comes up often is, you know, or situation is a patient comes, they've recently switched to a new treatment, let's say within the last three to four weeks, and don't know yet whether that new treatment is working. Um, that's not a time when a patient could directly move on to a clinical trial because really clinical trials are looking for patients whose cancer is worsening. And as the treatment switch, the switch is to the trial. Um, it would be a fine time for somebody to come in for a second opinion four weeks after they switch treatment if they're interested in teeing up future options for clinical trials or understanding what might be available down the line. And that would certainly always be appropriate. But really the best time to inquire about a clinical trial is when you receive the news that cancer is worsening, because that's really the time the decision would be made to go on clinical trial treatment or standard of care treatment. Right, and uh, I'd like to say that the best treatment for a certain patient is the one that it's working, either it's standard of care of cl or clinical trial. So although we are always happy to talk about clinical trial options, if what a patient just started or is currently on is working, uh, um, patients continue on that for as long as it's working and is at that time when the scans show that it's no longer progressing, that it's the right time to consider a clinical trial. So it, it all depends on, on the clinical trial and the specific clinical trial and protocol. Most of the trials uh, set up as the age of 18 as the minimal requirements, but there are efforts and the, um, uh, to try to expand them you know, to, to younger patients if it seems that uh, it's safe for that particular drug. It's pretty rare for studies to exclude older patients. Uh, it, that used to be more common, uh, but nowadays, if, if you write a study that excludes older patients, you have to have a very good reason, otherwise it will not pass regulatory review. Although breast cancer most commonly happens in women, about 2,000 men per year in the United States are diagnosed with breast cancer. And it is very true because it's a relatively rare population that most of how we treat male breast cancer is based on data generated mostly from women with breast cancer. Um, historically in the past, many clinical trials just sort of wrote that only women were eligible and it was very frustrating for both male patients as well as their doctors because in most cases it really made no sense to exclude men. And so the FDA actually has really been quite active in this area and um, and really push back if an investigator wants to exclude men. And so uh, similar to any age restrictions, uh, one has to have a very good biological reason to exclude men from clinical trials these days. So the vast majority of metastatic clinical trials do include men. It's hard to conduct a um, metastatic breast cancer trial only in men um, because Fortunately, of the men who develop breast cancer, many are diagnosed at early stage, and most never have a metastatic recurrence. So the population of male metastatic breast cancer patients is relatively small, uh, and, and too small really to conduct like a phase three trial. So in most cases for metastatic breast cancer, we're not seeing dedicated male breast cancer studies, but we are seeing that uh, nowadays, um, it's the, really the rare exception in terms of trials that would exclude men, and, and most trials include men with breast cancer. In general, the way clinical trials are written is that so long as a patient is benefiting, benefiting from the treatment, the patient can continue the treatment on the clinical trial. And even if the trial has a result that comes out, most trials have a provision that so long as a patient is continuing to benefit, the patient continues on the trial and can receive the study drug as part of the trial. Um, so that could vary. Uh, you know, sometimes we know within two months that the trial treatment's not working and the patient comes off the study. And there are patients who are on the same clinical trial for two, three, four, five years or longer because the trial treatment is working for that long. So uh, a question that comes often is what is the cost of participating in a clinical trial? And the way that the clinical trials are designed, what is standard of care 
as part of a clinical trial, meaning uh, the regular blood draws uh, to see the doctor before your treatment or the regular scans are still billed to your insurance. So the patients will still get their co-pays, but everything that is specific to the clinical trial, either the experimental drug or experimental um, uh, uh, blood work or anything else that it's uniquely given uh, as part of the clinical trial that is paid by the clinical trial. Right. So if, for example, you are a patient already at Dana-Farber, you're getting your chemotherapy here, participating in a clinical trial from a financial standpoint won't look very different because you'll be used to sort of whatever your, however your insurance deals with scan costs and your co-pays, et cetera. Um, I always tell people who come from a different center and they come, it is important to make sure that the clinical trial site is in network if possible. If it's out of network, um, there are methods to appeal um, to allow exceptions for patients who enroll on clinical trials. That makes a big difference in your co-pays. Uh, and so that's a really important question to ask if you're not already treated at that institution. I think that there are many uh, new exciting drugs or class of drugs right now in metastatic breast cancer. And I, I must say that uh, although we are not yet where we and our patients and their families want to be, that is, you know, the finding the drugs that will bring cure for everybody. I was just talking to Dr. Lin before this interview started that we've made significant advances in the last years, and that is very encouraging to keep going uh, towards, you know, a better future and, and hopefully a cure for everybody at some point. But I think that we need to start when we talk about this topic, obviously, we need to touch on immunotherapy just because, you know, the mechanism of action is so amazing that it's not to kill the cancer cells directly, but it's waking up your immune system so that they can do that job and hopefully stay awake so that no other uh, uh, cancer cells might develop. Um, I think that breast cancer has, has uh, for once, has not been leading the way, you know, in terms that immunotherapy has seen more approvals uh, in other diseases, and, and there's many reasons to explain that. But in the last few years, we saw approval of immunotherapy for the treatment of triple negative breast cancer, and there are a lot of efforts trying to look at how we can optimize or augment the response to immunotherapy, either in combination with other drugs or in other subtypes of breast cancer. Um, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm as well with antibody drug conjugates, uh, which are um, uh, drugs that combine very high doses of chemotherapy linked to targeted therapy. So that way, the chemotherapy, these high doses of chemotherapy are delivered directly to the cancer cells that have that receptor uh, that links to the targeted therapy or the antibody, therefore saving the, the good cells from uh, uh, at least some of the side effects commonly associated with those chemotherapies. And then I think there's a lot of excitement as well with new HER2 targeted therapies. Um, uh, uh, in the last few years, we have been the approval of uh, new drugs that have improved how these patients have done. And I, I think that very important um, as well is that, and something that I mentioned at the beginning is that these drugs are, are not only in the past, we were seeing most of the drugs in metastatic breast cancer, uh, improving what we call progression-free survival, meaning that patients would stay on on the same drug for a longer period of time. Uh, but we are seeing that some of these drugs now prolong survival as well. So our patients with metastatic uh, breast cancer are living longer. Yeah, and to that list, I would add for hormone receptor positive or estrogen positive breast cancer, you know, we know that anti-hormonal treatment or anti-estrogen treatment is effective. And there are lots of efforts to develop better anti-estrogen treatments in the form of what's called SIRDs or SARANs or PROTACs. There's all sorts of acronyms, but the bottom line is they're all trying to 
um, take advantage of the fact that cells are still dependent on estrogen receptor signaling. So that's a really um, important area. And then the other uh, thing that I think is expanding is really understanding that within each subtype of breast cancer, the sort of sub subtypes. So within triple negative, there's PDL1 positive and PDL1 negative, and we use those subtypes to figure out who might benefit from immunotherapy. And within estrogen receptor positive, there's there are patients whose tumors have a mutation in a PIK3CA gene or not, and that allows people to potentially receive a medicine called albulisib or PCRE. And so what we're sorting out is within subtypes, what are the special additional characteristics that could also be targeted? And right now, many of those kinds of studies are in phase one or phase two trials, trying to understand whether these new vulnerabilities that we found can be targeted with medic medications effectively. I think that still the most challenging subtype to treat is triple negative breast cancer. And the reason for that is that the sort of um, spectrum of options we have is more limited than patients with HER2 positive breast cancer, where we have a whole series of regimens that can be effective and that we can give one after another or in estrogen positive breast cancer, where we have the whole group of hormonal therapies and the whole group of chemotherapies that we can consider. Uh, for triple negative breast cancer, we still rely by and large on chemotherapy. And the exception is those patients who have um, cancers that are PDL1 positive, where we add immunotherapy to chemotherapy. Um, so what I think you know, uh, is happening over time is really trying to better understand new targets in triple negative breast cancer. So we know estrogen is not a target, we know HER2 is not a target, but there surely are other targets. And that's an, an example of that is the um, antibody drug conjugate called sazituzumab or Tridelvi, which targets something called trope 2 that happens to be present not only on triple negative breast cancer, but lots of other cancers as well. Um, and so that's an example of a new target um, in triple negative breast cancer that we can take advantage of. There's a lot of work um, trying to understand whether targeting testosterone in the form of the androgen receptor might be helpful in triple negative breast cancer. Uh, there's also efforts um, in looking at those patients who have a little bit of HER2 uh, on their cancer cells, not enough to call the cancer HER2 positive, but a little bit. Uh, we call those cancers HER2 low. Uh, and there is a phase three trial we're waiting for right now, uh, the results of, and maybe we'll have a new option um, sometime before the end of this calendar year. So the reason I chose to specialize in oncology is, um, is many reasons. Um, one reason is that it's a specialty where um, even in 2021, we take care of the whole patient. So, you know, cardiology, you're, you're taking care of somebody's heart, right? And uh, nephrology, you're taking care of somebody's kidney function. And in oncology, I'm not taking care of the patient's cancer, I'm taking care of the patient. Um, and I really like that holistic aspect of the care. Um, the other thing that I think is really exciting is that the kinds of research in oncology are so varied and they're all so interesting and we get to apply them every day in taking care of patients. So it's all the way from basic science and understanding you know, what is the certain gene that we're targeting and why do we target it, um, all the way to um, uh, you know, research that might feel more fuzzy, like um, what is the best way uh, to help people from an emotional standpoint through their cancer experience. Um, and so I really like the, the fact that um, it's never boring, it's always interesting, it's always different, it's challenging. Um, and then breast cancer in, in particular, I think people uh, living with breast cancer, uh, partly because there's so much public awareness of breast cancer, tend to be very well informed. They do their own research, they're really interested. Um, and um, you know, some people find that to be off-putting and they don't really want to answer questions, but I find it to be really interesting and rewarding um, because people are really invested in their care um, and it really feels like a partnership. And I, I think that that's very special. I, I chose oncology uh, because I thought it was the best option. 
I, I still think it is, but uh, at the time when I had to make a, an option, I, I thought that it was obvious. And uh, um, and for two main reasons. Uh, uh, one is because you take care of patients in a moment in their lives when they face a diagnosis that it's absolutely life-changing. And, um, and yet it's a moment in their lives where they are very vulnerable, but where they really see what matters. And, uh, and uh, they, it's so easy for them to separate what matters in life and what we think it matters. But when it comes a diagnosis of cancer, you realize that it doesn't matter at all. And, and that is uh, very humbling. And being part of that uh, journey um, is something that I consider a privilege, but at the same time, uh, makes me learn a lot with each of my patients. And secondly, you know, you just saw the amount of research and new drugs that we are talking, and it's probably the field where you see more research happening, new drugs. So, um, you know, there, there is always reasons for hope and thinking that in the future, patients will, will even have more options. And then, you know, and, and it's fun. You get to work with a lot of smart people in the lab. You get to know a lot of smart people. We learn with each other all the time. So why not choose oncology? So, I, I would just, um, I would like to reinforce that we should look at clinical trials as what is just another option on the table each time that a patient progresses. And as you are talking about treatment A or B that have been approved, we should be talking about clinical trials as well each step of the way and helping our patients to find what are good options for them that are uh, both uh, appropriate from their cancer standpoint and as well realistic from the patient and the family standpoint about traveling and so forth but should always be uh, uh, in our minds uh, um, as we discuss options with our patients. I would just add that, you know, clinical trials could be considered at any point in someone's disease. Um, we really don't think of clinical trials anymore as a so-called last resort. In fact, many trials um, are restricted to patients who haven't had that much previous treatment and you might miss out if, if, uh, if you're waiting only for the last resort kind of studies. Uh, so at every point in time, it's appropriate to think about whether a clinical trial makes sense. It doesn't always, but it's an important sort of question on the checklist each time you're making a treatment decision. Um, and the second thing that I would say is that, you know, try to keep an open mind about the different phases of clinical trials. Uh, sometimes people go in thinking, I only wanna be on a phase three trial, but in fact, some of the more exciting compounds uh, might be in a phase one or phase two trial. Uh, and so to sort of really evaluate the trial on its own merits, as opposed to putting it in a category first and then saying, I don't wanna do anything in, in one category or another. And finally, you know, I think your doctor and your oncologist, um, and if you work with a nurse practitioner, you know, really are really great resources because you know, one very important question to ask is why should I consider this clinical trial as opposed to standard treatment? Um, and you should get a good answer to that question that you feel comfortable with.